Good evening. It's six o'clock here, um, seven o'clock there. Pleased to meet you all. Uh, my name is Tom Kunish. I'm calling in from, as you can see, a Nashville area, which is Uchi and Muskogee land. Most people think that all of Tennessee was uh, Cherokee land, and that is one of the great problems, I think, of people learning Tennessee history or even what Tennessee people know is that uh, since the white contact in, happened over on the east side of Tennessee, uh, whites engaged with Cherokees for the longest period of time uh, and down into from up by Knoxville area down to Chattanooga area for over a hundred years. Uh, and only after the uh, whites moved over into the middle Tennessee, did they learn about really the, uh, the Muscogee or engage with the Muscogee on a much bigger, better level. So even here, they think it's Cherokee land, but uh, because the Cherokee sold it. And as a friend of mine says, Tom, I didn't say that the Cherokee owned the land or that it was their land. I just said that they were really good real estate agents. So... Um, I am from Minnesota. You can probably hear it in my accent. And uh, I have lived down here now for 30 years. I uh, was in the Navy as a Russian and Farsi linguist. I did my undergraduate in Spanish and religious studies, and then my master's in religious studies at Minnesota, and then my master's in divinity at uh, Berkeley. Graduate Theological Union, Stacking School for the Ministry. My mother's enrolled uh, Standing Rock, Lakota. I think it's important when you talk with people who claim to represent indigenous issues that you know who their people are and how they are tribally affiliated, specifically and solidly, because there are a lot of people. Have you guys been following the Buffy St. Marie story? Do you all know Buffy St. Marie? Ray, do you know Buffy St. Marie? John, you don't? She had a great song out called uh, Bury My Heart, My Heart at Wounded Knee. Fantastic song. And she is known as the, the rock star of... Uh, native music, popular native music. She's number one. Nobody came close to her until uh, this past year, Canadian television did a series on or a, a special on her and found out that she is, uh, she was raised a, I think it's Italian girl in the suburbs of Boston. And uh, then as she grew older, her persona changed, her idea of herself changed, her description changed, and that uh, her brother had tried to tell people several times that she was not Native, uh, and it never succeeded. But now they have exposed her, and so there are a lot of uh, frauds out there, and Tennessee is rife with them, rife with people who consider themselves or say that they are Cherokee or Yuchi or something like that and have no tribal affiliation. So if and when you have another speaker, it's always good to say, to know what tribe and is that tribe federally recognized and how are you related to the people in that tribe? So I'll say it again. Uh, my mom is an enrolled member of Standing Rock Lakota Oyate, Lakota Nation. Uh, that is in North and South Dakota. It's the reservation where Sitting Bull was sent and where he was killed. And uh, it's not originally Lakota land. It was Mandan land. My grandfather was born on the Fort Berthold Reservation uh, up in Northwest North Dakota. And my uh, his mom moved the family down to St. Paul, Minnesota, where we where my mom and then we kids were born. Standing Rock, like many of the, most of the Lakota reservations was given over to the Catholic church for 
uh, indoctrination and assimilation. And my family got into it very much. And so I was raised Catholic with 12 brothers and sisters. And um, I think that's about it. So I came into uh, indigenous issues later in life after grad school, after uh, an elder said, why don't you come sweat with us? And this was back in 1988. And I've been sweating ever since. And sweating is a sweat lodge, otherwise called Inipi, uh, stone lodge. And it is a ritual, a ceremony that we do whenever we want. Uh, I used to go twice a week. Now I go, I, then I went twice a month, as often as the guy, Lakota guy down in Georgia had one. Uh, so that's been my uh, learning, my education into it, uh, sun, sweat lodge, sun dance, and another ceremony called You Weepy. So those are my, that's my experience outside or inside of Lakota religion, Lakota people. And uh, it's hard down here because there are very few Lakota, of course. But um, let's see. So you have my degrees. Um, I have, uh, I was a UU monthly minister and a religious Unitarian Universalist monthly minister and religious educator for a while. Um, I was a teacher of Spanish, a teacher of uh, native religion and la oh, also a webmaster. But my last role and very happy role is uh, as a father to my five kids, my wife's son, and then my our together four daughters. And uh, they, they are also my biggest success. And spectacular is uh, my oldest daughter, Winona, just had a baby girl, Evie. Ah, all right. Any questions on that much so far? All right, we'll keep. We'll go right ahead. Uh, on next to your screen, or somewhere, maybe taking up all of your screen or half of it, is my slides, and it's called uh, my other alter ego is called slides, and I'll be going back and forth between these. You can uh, stop me at any time and ask questions. Uh, I can go for two hours. People have to stop me. So what I have done is I've prepared, I think, three slides for you guys, because usually I do 20. Uh, but I thought I would keep it simple today. And uh, let's see. Oops, I knew it, it was going to jump. Huh. There. So today I was going to talk about Land Back. You guys might have seen the uh, TV series or heard about the TV series called Reservation Dogs. And there was a, a scene on there where the family, uh, hus older gentleman and wife were driving by and they saw Land Back spray painted on the back of a sign. And it's a very hot topic in Native nations today and that is how do we get the land back that was promised uh, in treaties and taken that was not promised but was taken from us anyway uh, much the case in Pennsylvania but in large it's just restoring land to indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and people say what is Turtle Island? Um, well a question back to you guys, what is America? My response to what is America is that it's named after a guy named Amerigo Vespucci of the 16th century, who was an adventurer, a map maker uh, from Italy and Spain. And he drew a map and signed it Amerigo Vespucci. And then English people picked it up. And that English, Spanish, Italian, change the name to America. And so America is actually 
a European enterprise. It was a business venture. So when we say America and we apply it to the native people that were here, we're saying the natives who were here for an America for a European business venture, which is completely false. There were the people here had names, identities that had nothing to do with America. And I like to keep them separate. America is what Europeans created, named and created, and Turtle Island, and to the south, we can call it Abya Yala. Um, that's A B Y A, two words, Abya Yala. And uh, so there's a picture of why people would call it Turtle Island. Anybody know what kind of turtle that is? It's a snapping turtle. That thing can will bite your the tire of your car and hold on to it. <laughs> the, whole, the car will come crashing down. That thing has a vicious, vicious bite. It's a snapping turtle uh, up in Minnesota. And these things will burrow into underground for the winter and uh, hibernate. There's a special word for turtles hibernating. It's like turpid. And um, then when they crawl out, they can crawl out off a, a river bank or anything else like that. They can have this much. My daughter and I saw this about uh, five years ago when we moved, four years ago. Uh, we went down to a pond at the spring and we saw a turtle with a bunch of mud on its back. So I was lucky enough to find this picture and put the word on. So Turtle Island, Keawita in Lakota, is a way of talking about North America, indigenous North America before Americans, before Europeans. And so I will make that distinction all the time. I will try to focus on Turtle Island. And um, next slide, please. Oops. Back there. Uh, something you guys should know is there's a really cool word called kakanim, and it comes from kaka. And of course, Susanna, you know what kaka is in Spanish, and I'm sure everybody does. Do you know it, John, what kaka means in Spanish? Ray, do you? Okay. Well, it's kind of like what it's <laughs> It's poop. It's shit. Kakanim is a is a shitty word, is a bad word. Actually, that's more. It's a bad word. And I have these wo three words here that are struck out. Indian, as uh, this next slide shows us, is uh, Indians are from India. We are not. Indigenous people on Turtle Island are not Indians. That was Christopher Columbus's Cristobal Colon's mistake. And that has been uh, reiterated time and time again. We have said it's a mistake and people have, uh, I picked up the word and used it. Uh, and I think we should stop. Well, we need to stop, you know, whether it's Indian Affairs Committee, it should be Indigenous Affairs Committees. Native American, we should be talking about Indigenous people and Sioux is a word from the east side talking about the people to the west, not the not was Sioux, the little snakes in the grass. Uh, it was a term for the enemy, and it's not a respectable, not a respectful term. So best to say Lakota. Uh, if you're talking about Minnesota, Dakota, North and South da Dakota people, Lakota. And there's also another language group called Nakota. But it's good to know, to be able to distinguish when you hear somebody speaking English, it's good to hear, you know, whether they're Australian or English or Irish or American or Indian or Kenyan or whatever. There are all sorts of dialects that we use. And people like to be respected uh, and called by their correct national identity. And for Lakota, it's, it's not Sioux, it's Lakota or Dakota or Nakota. Got it?
All right. Um, so let's talk about land back, or I'll talk about land back. I haven't seen any hands yet, so uh, just turn your mic off or your mic on when you want to ask a question and blurt it out. Yes, Lois. I was wondering what you would think of the term Siberian American. I imagine that there are, but I don't know of any Siberian Americans. So Siberia is a place over in Asia. American is a place, are people who identify after the 16th century with the European enterprise. Are you talking about indigenous people up in Alaska? I'm talking about the four women who biologically, their mitochondria are throughout most of the tribes. And these four women did come from Siberia. Do you know how long ago that was? About nine or 10,000 years ago. So I don't, I don't know of anybody currently who identifies themselves by their genetic identity for uh, their descendants from people that long ago. You know, it's hard enough to know somebody that was a thousand years ago, much less a hundred. Most people don't know, can't name their family tree beyond a hundred years. Have you guys tried that? Can you name all of your great grandparents? You can, Suzanne? Good, good. That's a mark of a genealogist. <laughs> so, um, I don't, Lois, I don't, uh, it's not a word, I w not a term I would use. It's uh, oftentimes, in fact, there are movements uh, to, to reacquire or to change the names of indigenous peoples, indigenous uh, Native Americans, First Nations, to other words that try to mitigate, try to change the solid relationship between Native peoples of from the last 500 years to make it something less and to lessen Indigenous peoples' connection to this land and increase white people's connection to this land. Like um, you've heard of the Kennewick man. And then of course, of the uh, Leif Erikson's and the other Scandinavians uh, landings on the Northeast coast of Canada, yes? So people, and also you probably heard of the lost colony in is it North Carolina and other times and other places where people have been trying to push European identity more and more into the United States and older into the United States. Like there are many places here that are called Old Welsh. And that was something that Thomas Jefferson did because they couldn't believe that indigenous people here built these big, huge mounds or these cities that they found, or the burials that they found. They couldn't be these people that we are killing and stealing their land from. These were a different noble race, and the noblest race that we know of is from Europe. Um, but that that is uh, an ongoing question, Lois. Uh, in fact, I'm in a discussion now about where do where did people come from? Where did the tribes come from? And there are some tribes that say we were always here. And I, Lois, I, I, I got to say, I, I don't agree with that. I do believe that there was a migration uh, from Asia into this continent. And it could it also simultaneous. There are boats that may have that crossed uh, the Pacific. How? I don't know. But landed on the west coast of what we call South America, Abya Yala, but that there were repeated migrations from Asia 
over to what we call Alaska and then down the coast. Now, whether it was land bridge, well, that we know that there were land bridges and we know that there were boats and that people could travel both ways. So one person is trying to say that the Bering Strait theory has been debunked and I don't think that's true. So in, in one sense, Thoas, you're right. Uh, but it is long ago, so it's almost like us claiming to be African. Um, so getting back to land back, uh, I want to talk about, it's just three slides. I'm going to show you them. There they are. There's three, two, one. That's all I have. Uh, I have a bunch more afterwards, but this will take me a long time. Uh, interrupt any time. Most of the time when people talk about native land, it is about old cultural sites. And I, uh, my expertise, my knowledge base is here in Tennessee and also up in Minnesota. My brother's an arch one of my brothers is an archaeologist up there. And I've know I've learned a little bit about Pendle Hill, but here we're talking primarily old cultural sites. And most often, it is the stuff that's above ground, like mounds, round-shaped mounds that are burial mounds. Uh, off, there are, oh, and those date from before the year 1000 in the Common Era. Then there are temple mounds that are flat, uh, have a flat top. And these are really from like St. Louis area down the Mississippi and down into the t Ohio and Tennis Tennessee River Valleys. Those are called Mississippian temple mounds. And they some have burials in them, some don't. So the easiest thing to preserve are the big things that are hard to move out of the way and would have taken people a lot of effort to dig, to take them down. So mounds still exist, burials in, uh, Nashville have been dug up and pushed and thrown, you know, crushed, thrown into the local creek, into the local river, done anything with, but uh, basically destroyed. And only recently, since the 1970s, have there uh, passed laws to protect native sites. And when you find here in Tennessee, in most places, even I bet you in, in Pennsylvania, when you find a dead human body, all work has to stop, period. Whether it's five minutes old or 5,000 years old, work has to stop. The uh, coroner or archaeologist needs to be called in. The body, the remains have to be removed. And then if there are any more found, all work has to stop and then they have to assess whether this is a small or a large site. And oftentimes that is cheated on. In one site down in Chattanooga, they said it was five to 10 burials and it turned out to be a hundred. A, 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 a perfectly intact village site. So, and there was a town site and that is now also Moccasin Bend down in Chattanooga, the largest archaeological site uh, in a major city. So that's what most people think about when they think of native land. They think of reservations that people have already, or they think of old cultural sites. And in these cases, what happens is that uh, either the state tries to acquire the land, like uh, I'm thinking here in Tennessee, a biggest mound. Oh, all the big mounds here are saved and are now owned by the state of Tennessee. And then there are, uh, there's private property, a former senator here in Nashville area owns a set of mounds on their property that they have worked to preserve. And um, also a housing development for a, retired, a retirement village and their golf course owns a couple of uh, mounds. And for that, we got a conservation easement. And what a conservation easement is, is it's an agreement. Let's say 
Ray, that you own 20 acres and that you have a mound on it. And uh, I come up to you and I say, Ray, this is a nice mound. I want to preserve it. And you say, don't touch that thing. And it's mine. Gall dang it. And I say, easy, easy. Okay. It's yours. But how about uh, since we're talking positive relationship with indigenous people here, how about you allow us, whether it's the Tennessee Ancient Sites Conservancy or the Native American Indian Association of Tennessee or the Lenape Tribe of Pennsylvania, how about you uh, uh, agree that to put our name on the lease or on the deed of the property and say that uh, we have a specific interest in the preservation of that site and that that site you would commit to it being preserved in perpetuity and that the group, the indigenous group and anybody else after them would have a uh, simply a say, a role to play as a speaker for the mound and for preserving it. That's what a conservation easement is. So that's the business that I'm in. Uh, Tennessee Ancient Sites Conservancy is trying to encourage private and public landowners to give easements to us and or to other tribal entities. Seeing no questions, I'll go on to the next one. The land back is also, uh, tribes want to acquire land for community use. Number one, Standing Rock wants to get back all of the land that was taken that was bought away. Like my great uncle had 160 acres and he sold it so that he could get the cash and uh, move back to Minnesota. He actually ended up moving back to Oklahoma. But he was raising kids at the time and he needed money more than he needed that land. So he sold his land. Standing Rock, many reservations are trying to get their land back. There's one reservation here in Tennessee. You guys know that Pennsylvania has no reservations, right? That's, uh, so a tribe, whether it's the Lenape tribe of Pennsylvania or the Lenape nation of Oklahoma, or that's out in Oklahoma, will want land, not simply uh, to care to you know, care for a mound site or a burial site, but also for community community use, meaning that they would like to put uh, housing, they would like to have a farm or, you know, gardens and fields. They would like to put up solar panels or a windmill. Uh, they want to put up a healthcare facility and a school, maybe. This is exactly what happened with the, with the, Choc uh, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, where Alex Haley, do you know Alex Haley, the guy who wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X? He grew up in Henning, Tennessee. And there was a group of Mississippi Band of Choctaw, meaning they their headquarters were in Philadelphia, Mississippi. There's your connection. Uh, they came, they, uh, they were migrant workers. They moved up to that town of Henning every summer to work the fields, and then they would move back. And after this happened for a generation, some decided to stay there, go into the schools, and then the first thing they did was build a senior center and then um, housing. Uh, I think it was housing and then a senior center and then school. And they bought land. So, and you see that number one down there? Um, they bought land, fee simple deed, the same way that you buy your house or you buy 
any piece of land in fee simple deed. They <coughs> put $1,000 down, cash on the line, got the land, and they did that improvement. In, <coughs> I think it was 2008. Let me check on that real quick. Um, hmm. I guess I don't get to see my notes. I think it was 2008. They took the 90 acres that they had and uh, they put it in trust with the United States government and it became reservation land, tribal land. So now there is one tribe in all of Tennessee that has tribal land and it is the Choctaw who were here traditionally uh, back in 1600s, 1700s, over in West Tennessee. So that is one of the reasons for land back. The next one, uh, we'll cover, I'll cover a couple more reasons. Am I talking okay? Anybody want a break? Anybody want to ask a question? Okay. Oh, Lois and then Susanna. Is it curious how many acres have you personally been involved with? I think it is about, well, it's three acres at Glass Mounds site. And we signed, we just signed our first conservation easement that had been in the works, Lois, for 10 years. I just moved up here five years ago, and the former president said, Tom, would you take this over? And so that was my job, was to close that deal. Actually, the guy who had set it up closed the deal. And then to uh, put up signs on other places around. That's what we're working on now. And we have another one in the works. And most of these are mount, or the ones we're talking about are mound sites. And they generally take less than an acre. But they are the ones that are most threatened, apart from the underground ones. And the another problem, Lois, is that once you tell people about a site, once you start talking about it, other people find out. And then the grave looters, the grave robbers uh, and looters come and uh, start taking it apart. Susanna? Yeah, what what um I know this is um this is not really on topic, but what happened to the Pennsylvania um tribes? The Lenape? Yeah, what happened? The Lenape and maybe the Shawnee. Uh, they were pushed out and you know the word decimate? Ray, yeah. do you know that word decimate? What does it mean? One in ten. Uh, you took it away from Ray. Oh, sorry. Ray knows All right. he's, Ray's a mathematician. He knows that. Okay. Well, I find that word to be problematic when we talk about Native American history because it's a popular word and people think it means so much. To kill one-tenth, that is awful. That's not what happened with the Native American population here. The proper word would be noventimation. Do you hear that, Susanna? What that word in there is? 90%. 90% death. Yeah. There's a map where, oh, here it is. Wow. I'm going to see if you can see. See this map of Tennessee? Yeah. This brown part is Muskogee. This is Yuchi, and this is, uh, I think that, yeah, that's Cherokee. But do you see all of this white? Yeah. This map is a first contact language map. And that says, that names the tribes that white people encountered. In all of this white area, that is South Carolina. North Carolina, Kentucky, 
all of this white area, no people were encountered. Hernando de Soto came through from Florida, moved up through here in 1540, took a left, went down this way, and then went up and exited, died over in Memphis. That's a very close map of his route. And then another guy, uh, I'm blocking on his name right now. But that is 90% death. Around from European contact. That is not battles. Yeah. That is not people migrating away. That is death. No ventimation. So, uh, what happened? Uh, I don't have that map. Uh, extent. I do have that map, but I don't see where it was in Pennsylvania. But the Lenape were pushed out. It was an early encounter. They were pushed, and I don't. We can discuss whether or what rights William Penn, his dad, the king, his sons <laughs> had to the land, and if they uh, walked, yeah. trotted, ran the land borders correctly. But what happened was, oh, yeah. just a minute. Um, I have, uh, hmm, let me check this. Have you heard about the, is it Gnadenhutten massacre? Uh, I think it happened in Ohio, and, this, and the date was, um, just a minute. It, the anniversary was yesterday. Let me check real quick. Gennaden Hooten Massacre in New Philadelphia, Ohio, in um, 1782. Pennsylvania militiamen and frontiermen murdered 96 pacifist indigenous people, most of whom were of the Delaware the Nape tribe in the village of Gennaden Hooten near present day New Philadelphia, Ohio. March 8th. 1782, Pennsylvania killed them. So when we um, talk about what happened, I, I hope that you guys introduce that new term instead of decimation, a no ventimation is what happened. But uh, let's go into reasons for land back. Uh, Cultural preservation is a business. It's an academic business. Most people think of archaeology as an academic field, like the study of Spanish, teaching of Spanish, art, whatever, maybe mathematics. But archaeology depends on the existence and the acquisition of old sites to be taken apart and studied. Um, so that's one of the reasons why people, why white people want cultural preservation is they want to learn more about people that were here and it feeds an industry, uh, an academic industry. And the second one is tribal history. That's kind of problematic because lots of tribes are put on places that were not theirs, you know, like Standing Rock. But, uh, to return land to a tribe is essentially to preserve it for their culture. We hope to get land back here in Tennessee, and there is a group, a tribe out in California that is getting some Quaker land. Have you been following that? Have you heard no. about that? I can send that to you uh, after tonight. But it was a Quaker school that went under. And then they made it into a retreat center and stuff, and it went under. And now they are saying that this is traditional land of uh, this specific California tribe. This is north of Sacramento. Wow. This tribe had been terminated. I don't know if you guys have heard that term, but since the 50s, in the 50s and 60s, one of the policies of the United States government was to try to terminate 
official relationships between the federal government and tribes. They wanted to declare tribes dead and the responsibility towards them accomplished. So they were out to terminate tribes. That was one of the issues, one of the goals of indoctrination and assimilation was extermination. And it was not extermination through uh, gas or bullets or anything else. It was uh, starve them out, kill all the buffalo, and then uh, push them off of land and uh, take away their culture so that they are essentially melted into the melting pot of the United States. So this uh, group was terminated and now they have an opportunity to get, I think a hundred acres back for themselves. So I'll get you that information. Uh, that's local area to reestablish tribal connection. And that's one of the things we hope to do here in Middle Tennessee is get some land back to establish that connection with the Yuchi tribe, which has been long forgotten and ignored. One of the problems, one of the more interesting problems with this plan, um, an elder, his name was Gage, from the Muscogee Creek Nation, came down to Chattanooga and went back to his people. He was Speaker of the Nation, Wilbur Gage. And when we went out to see him, he talked with us about all good stuff. And then he said, you know, I get spanked. Well, not literally spanked, but I get verbally spanked every time I go out back east to our homelands in Tennessee. We said, why, why is that? And he said, uh, and who does it? He said, my elders sit me down and chastise me, uh, verbally punish him for having come back here because they said that when they were removed, uh, they were told when they got to Oklahoma to take your shoes off, uh, smack the dust, the dirt out of those shoes and never look back east, back home and never go back east. So in, in this sense, uh, he was committing a kind of cultural crime by coming back to the place where they used to live. So, but we still want to reestablish that tribal connection. And of course, people here want to know the history of the land. Uh, they want to think that they have some ownership in it, feel like they have ownership in it, feel like they understand the history and that they are responsible land owners, land users by learning the history and teaching it. Uh, a mother at a Nashville Friends meeting this morning just uh, came up to me and said, Tom, where is the good history to teach my kid? Um, to say why we are here and who lived here and who should we be respecting and talking with. So that's good to reestablish the tribal connection and to uh, educate current white and black occupants of who lived here before. The tribal tribes also want to extend, extend their land base for sovereignty, you know, just because uh, more land means in some ways uh, there's more room to grow food uh, to become self-sufficient and to become autonomous. Tribes do not want to have to rely on the United States government. Uh, there are, there's a contractual agreement with most tribes that the United States ha is compelled by law to, to honor, but most tribes, every tribe that I know of, I should say, is trying to become self-sufficient and more profitable. And of course, you guys, uh, have you ever, have you guys been up to see the Mashantucket Pequot muse, uh, Museum or the uh, casino? That's a wonder, it's a wonder to behold. My sister was the tribal attorney for them. Th that's a whole nother story. 
Uh, and the last one, the last reason for land back, the one that usually tickles most Quakers' interest is uh, the justice issue, that land was wrongly taken. And uh, we have a generational responsibility to honor uh, or to do something about the stolen property that we have acquired and that reparations should be made somehow, some way. And then that just opens, then that opens the door for discussion. So um, I think I have talked for a while. Is that true? Yes, Lois. I just going to ask, when you talk about reparations, can you give examples? Um, <clears throat> there's a group out in uh, Seattle that I think it's the Duwamish land rent. And depending upon your interests and your notes, if you give me any notes that you have and say, please say more about this, I can give you the sources for all of this. So like for land rent, Lois, the group is Duwamish out in Washington state. And they say, uh, people who live here ought to contribute like $100 per family every year to us for taking our land. Um, there is a group called nunsandnuns.org. Nuns as in N-U-N-S, like the Catholic sisters, and nuns meaning atheists, people who are not any spirituality, N-O-N-E-S, nuns and nuns. There's a Catholic order in Little Falls, Minnesota, up north of where I grew up on the off of the Mississippi River, I think on the east side, where anybody know the most famous person who ever came from Little Falls in the United States? Custard? Say what? Custard? No, no. Ah. I'd give you a booby prize, but uh, Charles Lindbergh oh. came from Little Falls and the Lindbergh baby, all that stuff happened up there in Little Falls. Um, these nuns are aging, dying off, and they got involved in social justice issues. And they said, geez, whose land is this? And when we die, who are we going to give this land to? And do we really legitimately and morally own this? And so they have been in discussions now with the local tribes about who should, what they should do. And they are moving towards a transition of giving the land back to the tribes. Right now, I have another sister who's a uh, state senator and in the early 1900s through 1950s, the state of Minnesota was taking Anishinaabe, which is the right way to say Chippewa or Ojibwe, taking Anishinaabe land and adding it to what's called white earth forest. And my sister has uh, introduced legislation to return that land. So there those are three different, oh, and the California example I gave you, those are four different examples of land return. One in California, one land, uh, that is selling the land back to the tribe or gifting it to somehow, they have not decided how they are going to work out the transaction uh, from Quakers to tribe in California. In See, in Washington, it is land rent. It is asking non-native people to pay an annual fee, rental fee for being on their land. In Minnesota, uh, there are two. One is white earth uh, forest land return, and that has to be done by the legislature. And the other one is Catholic nuns returning land. There was another point in which um, I think this was Wisconsin and the Catholic Church had some property that was empty. 
They had buildings, you know, it may have been an old school, maybe an old seminary out, out of town. And a group of indigenous people went and occupied it and said, this is now ours. This was some years ago, and the Catholic Church did not fight them. Wow. So um, there are two other ways that Quakers have developed. And I will send you their two brochures. I don't know if you heard about this, Lois, or if that's why the question, the invitation. But um, one is suggesting that every congregation, every religious congregation in, in the United States and Canada, whether it's Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Quaker, Unitarian, Universalist, commit to acquiring and gifting back uh, 160 acres to the tribe that was their last. So it would be suggesting to Arch, uh, Arch Street community that you acquire 160 acres somewhere that the Lenape would like and uh, ask your members to fund it and then give it. That's one way. There, there used to be a study uh, or the Pew Research Center has oftentimes studied religious groups, and I think you guys know that Quakers are among the richest. Did you know that? Uh, it's oftentimes Episcopalians, uh, Reformed Jews, and Unitarian Universalists who have the most money per person of any denomination, and Quakers are right up there. Wow. So that is one uh, idea. Oh, there's a, there's three like this, but the other brochure says, um, when you sell your property next, whether it's, whether you're living in a house, a condominium, a boat, whatever, that you donate 1%, you commit to donating 1% of that land transaction to the local tribe or to a local tribe. Could be a tribe of your childhood, but to a tribe. So that would, that's another way of contributing. And the third way that popped into my head and now it's gone. Uh, it's gone. I'll pick it up when it comes back. But those are two ways that Quaker indigenous people have proposed to uh, Quaker congregations to contribute, Con Quaker congregations and Quaker individuals. I'm interested. You ha obviously have an incredible family. I mean, you're just reeling off how extremely successful your family is. Um, you didn't come from a poor family. You couldn't have. Or did you? And you had, you had all these amazingly successful siblings. I mean, a, a senator, an architect. What was the other one? A lawyer? Attorney. A lawyer. Yeah, yeah attorney and archaeologist. Uh, right. We paid for our ways through college. We, my, we did not get any help. We, they, my dad was an attorney. Okay. He was a public attorney. He did okay. uh, child welfare law, Stearns okay. County, and my mom was at home. And I thought, compared to many of the kids that we went to, we went to Catholic schools, that we were very, that we were poor. Uh, yeah. We had cloth diapers. We, we had one pair of shoes every year. <laughs> and... Uh, my sister, my oldest sister got a scholarship because of her genius abilities, the oldest one, but the other ones of us had to work our way through. I went on the GI Bill. Okay, yeah. Uh, my sister Patrice and Mary worked at, uh, to put themselves through school. Jim did too. Jim uh, graduated from 
St. Cloud State University in archaeology. Um, I won't say we did not get any help from the uh, reservation, although our my nieces and nephews did. They were able to go to University of Minnesota Morris on native scholarships. But uh, the rest of us uh, worked and I could talk more about that, but. Right, but you got the most important thing. You had very intelligent, educated parents, which um, goes seems to go very far. It does go very far. Yeah. I would. Another thing is that uh, we didn't learn, or maybe it was our dad asking us questions, but it wasn't so much education from them. But uh, I did not realize when I was young that Catholic schools were private. I, because the community that I grew up in was the second most Catholic county in the United States. Uh -huh. uh, I thought everybody was Catholic and that um, people who went to public school were either Protestants or <laughs> you know, step a little, or uh, didn't care about religion much. But uh -huh. I thought uh, our Catholic schools took everybody and I have to say that they were excellent and that I do not know, and I've read, I've looked about a, a sex abuse scandal by any of the people in those schools or those institutions. Right. Yeah. Remarkable. I um I just want to make a comment. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned that um, the Muriel mounds were momentum mated. Am I saying that right? Oh, uh, that the population was Noventi Mason. Mated. Okay, okay. So Noventi is 90 and Mated comes from Matar to kill. Okay. So 90% killed. And it was by uh, primarily by uh, sickness, disease. And you also, you also mentioned that when um, here in the East, at least, um, you mentioned that um, when there is a body found during an excavation or something, um, a, a, or a historical site, that the work has to stop. And about seven, I'm going to say seven years ago, I was a member of First Baptist Church of Philadelphia at 17th and Sampson Streets. And they were working on the Vine Street Expressway, I believe it was. and they found the bodies and they found out that it was part of a burial ground of first Baptist church. that had been forgotten about wow. and all work stopped. And we got word of it. I was on the board then I was, I was one of the deacons at that time. And um, we got word that the university of Pennsylvania was coming in and they came in with Technology, the, the the things that go over the ground that can sense a body under underneath and things oh, like that. Oh, radar. Okay, and yeah, yeah, and um, they were um, we we were assured um that everything would be you know DNA was done on the bodies and things like that, and we were assured that the bodies were treated with all the utmost respect and all, and it's a shame that courtesy doesn't extend across the country you know with indigenous people i i think that's a, a, a sin almost and to use that word <laughs> when when tva came through here in the 30s and 40s with the work with wpa and everything else they dug up a lot of white cemeteries and uh they had to move they moved some and some communities said leave them where they are. So there is a cemetery out in the Tennessee River that uh, towards the end of summer, you can see the gravestones appear out of the water. Uh, okay. So, but for removal, there uh, most people want their relatives to stay in place. They can also, uh, a church or business, anything can file a request for a court order to remove a cemetery. So that, so, so the Baptist church there 
had a choice is to uh, leave the graves intact and either uh, concrete over them or pile dirt on top of them or just leave it alone or to remove it and put it somewhere else. Yeah, and they chose to remove it, yes. Yeah. That's... I do have a question for you mm -hmm. real quick and I'll be quiet. The Muskegee Indians, am I saying that correctly? Muskogee? Muskogee Indians. I'm a, I'm just a hokey from, hokey from Muskogee. Okay. Um, song? Now, I don't mean this, this is a pun. I mean this with respect. Is they, they were called the Creek Indians also? Yes. And somebody told me that the saying, we'll get together tomorrow if the creek don't rise. And the thinking behind that is that the Creek Indians would raid the towns during, I guess, times when they had to and things like that. Is that any truth to that? Do you know that? or I've heard that expression. I uh -huh. did not take it as a reference to the Muscogee people, but you bring up an interesting question, John. In 1782, I believe, um, I think it was 1782. I'm not sure when Tennessee became a state, but the but George Washington was president of the United States, and it was a year before Tennessee was admitted. In a okay. Philadelphia newspaper was printed a letter by George Washington asking for a treaty conference with the with the Creek in down in Nashville because he was trying to figure out, they were trying to figure out why the Muscogee, why the Creek were continuing to raid this area. So what I'll tell you, John, is that I'll look it up. Oh. And uh, because that's, I've heard it before, I've thought of it before. Uh, and to hear it again, just says uh, it's important. And George Washington himself in Philadelphia mentioned his concerns about the creek rising oh okay here's a little here's another tidbit uh for, do you know french john a little bit very little okay you know what rouge means red right bat right rouge how about baton baton rouge red stick red stick you know yeah. do you know what that means well, why would somebody I was under the impression from uh, where I, I was told that the red sticks were sort of boundary markers. Uh, I heard they were dipped in blood and that was for the hunting rights to that land. And you didn't go past those markers. The red sticks were a bundle of sticks, uh, uncolored, primarily, mostly, majority, vast majority of regular sticks with one red stick okay. in the bundle. And that they would travel with, uh, or messengers would be sent out with these bundles of sticks. And every day that they traveled, they would take out a stick and they would take it to different Muscogee Creek towns and say, when the red stick when it's the red stick time, we will meet down at like Flotoco or Tokabichi and we will attack. So oh, the, the okay. red sticks, the red sticks in that uh, 18th century history were the, uh, was the Creek resistance, was oh, the Muscogee okay. resistance. And the reason why they're called Creek is because all the towns, uh, it would be something like calling somebody, um, a freeway, freeway German, I don't know, freeway American, whatever. From all the towns on the freeways, rivers and oh. creeks were the freeways. There were the pathways back then, the primary ones. And the creeks settled on, or the Muscogee settled on creeks for a constant water and a constant food supply and a constant reflooding of the local uh, bottomlands to for corn it was the evolution of 
from the woodland period to the Mississippian, which created out of the Mississippians came the Muscogee, who were big corn growers. You know, as the push of uh, the evolution of agriculture into uh, Turtle Island that created these huge temple mounds, Cahokia, Moundville, Mound Bottom. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And I do want to say one more thing real quick. Um, it does my heart good because I don't encounter many Native American Indians and that Native Americans, not Indians, I'm sorry, Native Americans that I know of by sight. And to hear somebody say, we sent our messengers out that way, and to, say, to hear the we part, and, and, and to hear somebody of an indigenous background, say heritage, to say we, you know, it, it gives me a, a warm feeling in my heart that, you know, the, 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 the Native Americans are still alive and going. It, it, I, you know, so I, I hope I wasn't offensive. No, no. Uh, and I understand that we have all, my mom would say Indian till the cows come home. All right. She, she was not, she would not change. She would say okay. Sioux. And okay. there are lots of people. In fact, in Philadelphia, and as you go farther north into Washington, my sister, I have another, the sister who's an attorney is now the administrator for the uh, administration for Native Americans. It's part of the federal government. It, it, they, use the word Indian all the time. And okay. it just chaps my hide, but it is a it is the empire. Yes. We are dealing with the government, which is the empire, and they have established their language, and they are not going to change unless it's compelled. Now, I don't know if you've been following the Secretary of the Interior, and she is pushing for changes in the names. Yes. You saw what she has changed all the words with squaw, it's happened first in Minnesota. All the words for all the squaw words were remained, uh, were, excuse me, removed. And now the Secretary of Interior is doing it herself. So change will come, but it requires us to model it. And um, I think of it as the N word is that. Mm -hmm. uh, Indigenous people can say whatever they call dang want to call themselves, but they should know that uh, you know what the Stockholm, what Stockholm syndrome is, right? Yes. Uh, identification with the perpetrator. We have that. It's also internal colonization that we have. Uh, my great uncle was sent to Carlisle Indian School. Okay. He was. Uh, <laughs> um, he's talked about in a book by my cousin whose name is Mona Power Mona grew up uh, her mom was Susan Kelly my mom's name is Louise Kelly it was the Kelly family out on Standing Rock uh, Mona went to Harvard uh, not because her mom paid, uh, but because of the uh, her scholarship and scholarships. She went to Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law School, and she hates it. And she's a writer, Lois. Uh, and the last, her latest book uh, talks about my uncle and his wife, who became chief of the tribe, uh, is out. It's called A Council of Dolls. And he went to Carlisle, and he both resisted, and she, his later wife, also, they both became internally colonized, adopted and adapted, or adapted and adopted to the uh, em imperial world, to the empire, to the United States. We all became citizens of the United States. I joined the Navy. You know, part uh, an imperial stormtrooper. <laughs> and so it takes a while to realize what it is, what has happened to us, what happened to my mom, what happened to my grandpa, and to start resisting. And it's slow. It's slow work. Most of it, like, you know, asking these th questions about the creek don't rise. We don't know these things. 
And so it is scholarship that brings them back. We didn't, people didn't know about the Yuchi and Muskogee here. It is people willing to learn and speak out. And it's very difficult because it's very, in a way it's expensive. It takes time, it takes effort. And uh, my wife says, how are you gonna pay for your dentist bill, Tom? <laughs> how am I gonna pay to, uh... so it's not, a, it's not a paid yeah. job, it's a labor of love. And uh, I appreciate your words, John. I, what, thank you. Thank I, you. Uh, what do you do to pay pay, pay bills then? What well, do do? Um, I speak. Um, I have done website design in the past, but you know, I'm so I'm old. That was what thirty years ago, twenty six years ago. I was doing website design, and I could code. <laughs> I can't do the Java and stuff they do now. But um, it's speaking engagements. Uh, yeah, nobody will hire me around here. Now, you can say it's because I talk too much or I talk blah, blah, blah. But generally, there is no place for, oh, uh, for an Indigenous person who doesn't have a degree in Indigenous history. Okay. So I taught a course in Native American religion. And that I could get by because I have a master's in religious studies. But I was, uh, I lived four years in Spain. I can speak Spanish pretty well. I was teaching Spanish at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And then um, the examiners came through and they had to fire me right away. So even though I spoke better than, uh, and I thought taught better than um, some of the other instructors, I couldn't make a living that, that way. And uh, nobody is interested in learning Native American religion and Native American history. They really do like white guys, white archaeologists, men teaching uh, Native history. And without a degree, without a master's in it, I guess I could go back and get it. But I, oh, I'm how... The other thing is that I am retired and I do get social security. So that I thank the United States government for. Well, you are a living treasure as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> wow. Nice words, John. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, it does help, you know, just to hear that validation. That, that helps. You enlighten me a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have to start um, talking about you so you get these engagements. Well, um, um, I am going to gathering this year up by you guys, and I will be speaking. I won't be paid. I'm uh, My stay there will be comp. Uh, comp. Comp. Right. What's the full word for comp? It's not compensated. Hey. Complimented? <laughs> taken anyway, care of taken care of so I'll be going there and I will be speaking on uh, one of the plenary sessions on the uh, Dakota Infida, uh, Intifada of 1868 or was it 1862 uh, 1865 anyway uh, I hope you'll come to that well, I hope I'm to see you there okay yeah. I need to be back from Puerto Rico then. Yeah. I'm going to show you. Oh, here. Look at this. Here is the uh, the things I talked about. The Native Land Reparation Pledge. Uh, that is by a uh, Wampanoag Quaker woman, Gail Melix. Do you know her, Lois? Gail Melix. Uh, she's up on Martha's Vineyard area. And, uh, oh, there's the other thing I wanted to talk about. The Minnesota Makoche Honor Tax. And that is another thing. My sister got into politics. She retired as a school librarian. Uh, she has three kids, raised them, 
with a Lebanese guy, divorced, married. Um, but she got into politics. One of the things why I think my dad mostly raised us with a sense of public responsibility. Maybe it's the Catholic in us, but a larger moral responsibility, a social responsibility. And that, uh, so she's in politics. It's a state senator, so she gets paid, I think, $40,000 a year, you know, for a half time. And she introduced this Minnesota Makoche honor tax along with somebody else. And that is that on every land transaction in the state of Minnesota, like 0.0001% of it would go towards a uh, building will be paid into a fund for the native tribes to use in reacquiring the land that they lost through all of the uh, problems, we'll say. This picture here on the bottom is uh, for the Duwamish uh, lease, uh, no, rent. And this, is the native land reparation that uh, Gail Melix is suggesting. So if you want to ask for another person to talk, Gail would talk about this. This is what she is promoting, the 1% of the sale price of your home that people dedicate and uh, commit to doing. And this is the one that I have promoted that every friend's monthly meeting and every congregation, religious congregation in, in the States commit to 160 acres. Well, 160 acres to Native people and 160 acres to African American people. Wow. I think I have uh, over probably overwhelmed your brains oh, with... One, one more question. Oh, we, um, I'm here all night. <laughs> and in Amnesty International, we have a, a member who's very interested in South Dakota. Um, and she went to a she spent some time in a reservation there and she came back absolutely appalled at how much land was being stolen from South Dakota and what, and what terrible shape people are in. Because there's, there's apparently laws about, um, about shops. So a regular shop, I mean, they had to buy things at, at exorbitant prices. I'm, I'm not quite, I'm sort of gobbling it, but she was absolutely horrified that people were, um, being treated so badly there. And and meanwhile, um, the land is just being stolen, 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 and stolen. And they're just pushing people off. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. It, it sounds like you're in better shape than they are. I mean... The land... Yeah. It's interesting. The land was more overtly stolen, you know, 100 years ago. And now what's happening is that pipelines are going through underground. And wow. that uh, the federal government says it has to go through. Uh, and that even though it's tribal land, it's still being held in trust by the USA government. So ultimately, the USA is the landholder of all property. And it can and will do whatever it wants uh, when it feels it needs to. So it's the power of eminent domain and uh, base, base ownership. So everyone, uh, everyone's property doesn't yes. matter. Everyone's property. Yeah. Wow. So we really don't own anything. That's you okay. hold it. You know, the same thing is true of tribes yeah. is uh, yeah. I know many people on tribes like the Eastern Band of Cherokee that they say that they the family say that they own their house. But really, it's being leased from the uh, from the tribe itself. It's communal property. And in, the, in that sense, uh, yes, we all, well, property we think we have is actually communal property of the United States. <laughs> Great, you've made my night. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dear me. So, Lois, anything more? Is she still there? Oh, I'm here. Yeah. This has been really informative. I'm hoping you'll send me a, a list of all these websites so I can 
put that in the text below this video when I post it. I'll do that. <laughs>